If you have your Bibles, open up to Exodus chapter 14. <clears throat> Several years ago, after many, many, many prayers, uh, the Lord opened up a door for me. It was the first and the only door that, that he opened after a lot uh, of prayers. Uh, sometimes I wish I would have uh, numbered how many prayers uh, were prayed. I was just fascinating to know. So it was the first and only door that he opened. I was excited about it, very thankful uh, to the Lord uh, about that. And I told him that. And it was perfect timing. So I did what anybody would have done when a door like that is open. And I, I took the opportunity and, and I walked through it. It wasn't very long after I, I took the opportunity that I realized it was not what I thought or what I expected it to be. God didn't work the way that I wanted him to. Uh, God didn't work the way that I had expected him uh, to work, and I felt stuck. I felt like I had made a mistake. Uh, the blessing became uh, a burden. Um, I viewed it as an obstacle. I even complained about it. Uh, I, I doubt I'm the only person that's ever done that, but I, I just wanted to be, be honest with you. But eventually I found myself on the other side of that situation. And I realized something that, that I knew, I knew to be true, but I just couldn't see it in the moment. I found out on the other side that God had always been with me through that and that God was working through that. And like I said, I, I knew that. In my head, I knew that. But I had such a hard time seeing it through the situation. How could God be working in this? How could God be using this? How could God have allowed this to happen in the first place? You know, you, you, think, you think those things. And, and you, can, you can begin to think some things that you shouldn't think uh, to begin with. But that's exactly where the Israelites found themselves and. Exodus chapter 14. No sooner than the Israelites had been delivered from Egypt <clears throat> and, uh, and made their way out with all kinds of possessions and, and livestock, and I'm sure were full of joy and celebrating, even singing God's praises as Moses led them out of Egypt, they found themselves stuck. Stuck between the deep waters of the Red Sea and the Egyptian army that was pursuing them just as fast as they could, that they could see them uh, coming towards them even on the, the horizon, neither seemed like a good or a safe option. <clears throat> and very quickly, in the midst uh, of their panic, they began to complain, I, I think even sarcastically, to Moses. And this is what they say in verse 11. Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you done this to us, Moses? This is, this is your fault, you know. Uh, it, it, you should have just left us in Egypt. You know, this is the first time that they complain of many more times throughout the, the wilderness wandering. And, and even before uh, God tells them that they'll wander, wander in the wilderness 40 years, they complain Quite a few times. Why? We had things pretty good in Egypt. I had a short memory, I think, uh, in many ways. But they, they, they thought they had things better in Egypt. So in, the, in their panic, they forgot the power of God that he had demonstrated. And even how uh, that, that power we looked last last week differentiated between Egypt and, and the Israelites, how Egypt suffered through most of the plagues and, and Israel it did not. They felt betrayed, I think, by Moses. And I think they even felt betrayed by God. Why would God do this? Why would God allow such a situation to arise so quickly after being delivered from a, a circumstance that was absolutely horrible? But the Lord was with them and he was always uh, with them and he had a purpose like me they just couldn't see it and like I think a lot of us we just can't see it in the moment so we're going to look at <clears throat> the story of of what God is doing there and as they before and as uh, they cross uh, the Red Sea uh, in verses one through four we see that the Lord says he's going to be glorified the Lord makes Moses a promise 
I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. <clears throat> You're going to see how I've laid this out. This, this uh, account is told, it's narrated in what's called a, a chiastic structure, which is uh, the, the author lays out uh, uh, a part of the story and then kind of reverses the story where it can fold over itself in a mirror. And it's fascinating how this happens. A lot of the Bible is written in, in this way. It, you just, you don't see it if you don't pay a, a attention to it or if you're not really looking for it. Uh, but it's fascinating. Uh, so I wanted to point it out in this story because it's interesting how it, how it takes place. But God says that he's going to be glorified over Pharaoh, verses 1 through 4. The Lord has a plan. He begins to share it with Moses. He doesn't share all of it. He shares a little bit, kind of uh, progressive uh, through this uh, story. But he says, here's what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to, to turn around and I want you to camp here by the sea. Pharaoh is going to think that you're trapped and he's going to come after you. He doesn't tell all of Israel this, just Moses. So Moses knows a little bit what's going on. Uh, not everything that's going on, not everything that God, that the Lord is going to do, but a little bit. He's already, he, the Lord's given a, a little bit of taste of, here's what's going to happen. And I think what he's saying is, Moses, trust me. I know, I know what I'm doing. It's hard to do. It's hard to do sometimes. Especially when we're, we think we're in control of our life and, and we, I know what's best for myself, right? I know what's best for myself. It's hard to do to trust sometimes. And so verses 5 through 9, we see that Pharaoh pursues Israel to overtake them. The plan is to bring them back into slavery. And apparently, Pharaoh had a short uh, memory as well. Because in a matter of days, he regrets allowing Israel to go. He regrets what he did in letting them go. And it says, verse 6, What is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? They... Israel's life difficult, but it seems that Israel made their life a little bit easier. So now Pharaoh and his people are having to do everything that, that the Israelites were doing for them. So he gets his chariot, his army, 600 uh, other chariots, and his officers ready, and they pursue after the Israelites. Tactically, Israel is at a disadvantage in every way. They had the manpower. They, they had over a million if, I mean if you do a little bit of calculation probably over a million people that's a lot it's a lot of people Israel had the manpower but no weapons no training nowhere to retreat to unless they wanted to run and drown themselves in in the Red Sea but that you know that's not an option plus they had their their women their wives and their children to take care of as well some not just looking after themselves but but all the the, the women and the children as well to protect and so Israel is troubled by Pharaoh's pursuit, but the Lord's going to fight for them. They see this army coming. Israel catches up with them, and, and, or excuse me, Pharaoh catches up with them. I, Israel sees, the Israelites see them bearing down, and they become terrified. They're scared, and, and rightly so, right? They have no weapons, no training, and here comes a, an army that's very well trained, very well outfitted, very professional. They know what they're doing. It would have been, from man's point of view, a no-brainer, right? We know who's going to win this, this battle if this battle uh, takes place. And so they began to, to panic. Again, they sarcastically complained to Moses, you've taken us out here because there's not enough graves in Egypt. So you've taken us out to a, a vast, huge place where we can all be buried by Pharaoh and his army. And they began to complain. This is the first, of, again, of many times that they complain, but what they don't realize is the Lord is at work. The Lord is at work. From their vantage point, the Lord has put them in a no-win situation. There's no way out of this. One side we have the Red Sea, the other side we have this army bearing down upon us. And it's easy, you know, for me to say, hey, come on, Israel, you, you witnessed you witnessed the plagues. You saw God work. You saw the, the way that he, he favored uh, all of you over uh, all of Egypt. You saw the things that he was doing. What, what's up? Why, why panic so quickly? Why, why not assume that you saw how God worked in Egypt? Why can't he work the same way out in the wilderness? At the, why can't he do something? 
but I have to, I have to look at myself. The trial was real. This was something real, this was something very real, real for them. And, and to their credit, they cry out to the Lord. They cry out to the right person. But God had a good reason for putting them in this situation. The Lord wants them to know that he is the Lord. And that he's going to protect them. Look at chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Easier said than done, right? I think so. It's easy to say, hey, here's what's going to take place. But when you're faced with two situations or, or, or you know one on this side and one on the other and both of them are no win I, I, I go into the ocean or I go into the Red Sea I, I drowned I, I turn and I face Pharaoh and his army I get killed another way I mean it, it's a no-win situation easier said to trust in God than actually done and so the Lord tells Moses to lift up his staff stretch out his hand over the water Moses has a staff, God reminds him. Remember, the staff becomes, the, in, in a way, the, the presence of God with Moses. It is through the staff that God, through Moses, accomplishes all the plagues, various other miracles that take place in, in, the, um, uh, in, in the presence of, of Pharaoh. God tells Moses to use his staff to divide the waters. I wonder what was going through Moses' mind when he said that. Excuse me? <laughs> what? I, I don't know how this is going to work, but okay, we'll, we'll do this. So Israel, he says, use your staff, uh, make a way through the Red Sea so my people can walk across on dry land to safety so that the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord and I will get glory over Pharaoh, just like he said he would, he promised. And then here's the turning point in the story. The angel of the Lord, who's going before them in the pillar of cloud, stands before the Egyptians and the Israelites. Let's read verses 19 and 20. Then the angel of the Lord, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. He was leading them. Now he moves behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. This is, God is protecting his people. That's what he's doing here. And there, was, uh, and there was the cloud and the darkness. And it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. I noticed something as I was reading that I think I've skimmed over uh, probably every time uh, that I've read this. In order to protect Israel, the Lord moves the cloud, the pillar of cloud, from leading them. Now to between them, between and, and separating Israel from Egypt, so he, the Egyptian army. So he's protecting his people, standing between them. And as the pillar comes before them, if I, if, if I understand what's taking place here, the pillar of cloud keeps the Egyptians in darkness, but it lights up the route through the reds. I'd never noticed that. Hey, y'all may be going, Sean, how, why, what are you doing reading your Bible? You've never seen that before. Uh, but I, I just skimmed over it. It's absolutely fascinating. He keeps the Egyptians in darkness, but lights up where Israel's going to walk. Another example of the differentiating power of God. He favors his people over his enemies. And so, here's how now this, this story can fold over into itself. Now Moses, now God doesn't tell him to lift up his, his staff in his hand. Now Moses does what God says. Moses lifts up his staff, stretches out his hand over the waters. He does what the Lord says. And the Lord parts the sea with what the Bible says is a strong wind. The Hebrew word for wind is ruach. I don't know if you remember, but we studied that uh, way earlier this year. 
And that word for wind, ruach, is also translated, do you remember? Spirits. So the Bible, God's word says, the wind came and separated the waters. I'm convinced that's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God came and separated the waters. So then the Lord fights. The Lord fights and the Egyptians are troubled. So at the beginning of the story, the, the Israelites, they see the Egyptians coming and they are troubled. But now the Lord fights for his people and uh, the Egyptians are now troubled. The Egyptian army pursues them and the Lord fights for his people. The Lord works on behalf of, of Israel and causes the Egyptian army to, to panic. And the ESV says this, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. The Lord caused the wheels of the chariots to fall off. That's what that means. They fell off. Which makes it very hard for the, the horses to drag the chariots with the soldiers inside when the wheels aren't on there. I mean, it doesn't work the way that it, it's supposed to work. And so the Lord frustrates Pharaoh's plan and everything falls apart. And now the Egyptian army's panicking. Let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And now, the waters overtake the Egyptians. Pharaoh pursues Israel to overtake them. And now, through God working and fighting for his people, the waters overtake the Egyptians. The pursuit has been reversed. Instead of Israel overtaking, or Pharaoh overtaking Israel, the waters overtake Pharaoh and his army. And Moses stretches out his hand over the sea. And through the leadership of Moses, the Lord causes the waters to crash back down, and now drowns the Egyptian army. None remained. And the Lord's promise is fulfilled. The Lord is glorified in verses 30 and 31. The miraculous work of the Lord has the desired effect. The Lord saved Israel that day. The people of Israel give glory uh, to the Lord. They believed in him and his servant Moses. The Lord was glorified, just as he promised. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like the Israelites? Do you ever feel like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place? I mean, that's, that's, where, it's, that's where they found themselves. Or like the Israelites, stuck between the, these dark, chaotic waters that as soon as you walk into them they will consume you and the other side you have this army that's ready to uh, destroy you it's a no-win situation have you ever been there or felt like you've been there or, or let's take the situation a, a little bit further have you ever been in a situation much like the Israelites where you didn't think God was in control and you questioned does God even know what he's doing I've been there I'm not happy to say it, but I've been there. And I think some of you probably have as well. One author said, God is not bashful about leading his people into seemingly impossible situations. It happens time and time again. And I think God still does that. God's not bashful about leading us, his people, into seemingly impossible situations where we wonder how in the world is the Lord going to make a way? How in the world am I going to come out of this? What am I going to look like on the other side if there is an other side? What's it going to look like? How is God going to work in this? Which would have been, i ask you a question, which would have been more beneficial for the faith of the Israelite people? If the Egyptians would have never pursued them in the first place, or the Lord fighting for and protecting his people in a very visible intangible way of parting the Red Sea and the subsequent destruction of their enemies. Which was better for their faith? Which grew their faith? God isn't interested in making life easy. He's interested in shaping and growing our faith. Have you noticed that? God rarely takes the easy way. Rarely. God rarely takes the easy way in life. He rarely allows us to take the easy way. Matter of fact, 
we're more prone to take the easy way. When, when we look at our lives and we try to lead our own lives, we take the easy way, but it always ends up messing things up, doesn't it? Usually, it, it messes things up. God rarely takes the easy way in life. Look at Exodus 14 again. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses 10 through 14. We read 13 and 14, but I'm going to start at verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. I would have as well. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. I would love to have seen how, or heard how Moses said that. Which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. <clears throat> there are a few elements at play here. The first is this, this uh, fear and despair. And, and that's what fear leads to. If I fear long enough or, or I really dwell on it, or I think about it, I become and get to the point of despair where nothing good is going to happen. There's no way out of this. Certain death, everything's going to be terrible. That's what happens. When I allow fear to sink into my life or take hold of the situation or whatever's going on, the end result is going to be despair, always. But the other side of this, the other element of, of this, is faith. And Moses says, stand firm. Stand firm. That's the idea of faith. Pay attention. Just stand here. Stand your ground. Believe in God. Pay attention and see what he's going to do. <clears throat> God works for his people. He always does. Then Moses says, the Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. <clears throat> when Moses said that, every one of those Israelites, sh their mind should have immediately gone just a few days back to everything that God did in the plagues. How God devastated Egypt and Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And how they just walked out of there with all the possessions they needed, the livestock that they wanted. What, what, what part did Israel play in the plagues? I would say they just stood there and were silent. It's kind of what Moses tells them to do again, right? Just let God work. The Lord fought for them then. He was fighting for them now. But the fear and despair was blinding them. It was getting in the way of their faith. They couldn't see spiritually because they were allowing what they saw physically to call fear and despair. You and I, we have reminder after reminder in Scripture. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. Trust the Lord. And I think about this story and, and what claim does it make in our lives. I think it's the ultimate reminder to trust God, especially in, in, in impossible times. Because he's at work growing and building and shaping my faith. That's what he's interested in. Because when I allow him to grow and shape and build my faith, he gets the glory. He will be glorified. When I trust in him and allow him to work in me, he will be glorified. You know, there have been times, and I imagine in, in your life as well, where I've witnessed the great power of the Lord, where I thought there was no way out, but he made a way in the right time when I thought it was not possible. I've seen the Lord take impossible situations and work them to his glory. And every time, I've had to humble myself and thank him. And sometimes, not only did I thank him, but I had to ask his forgiveness as well. Because I didn't believe it was going to happen. But he has. In Exodus 14 and verse 3, it says, For Pharaoh will say, 
of the people of Israel. This is, this is where God told Moses, I want you to turn around, I want you to camp here by the sea. And here's why I want, to, I want you to camp by the sea. He says, for Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. In other words, what he's saying is, <clears throat> when Pharaoh sees you camped here with the sea behind you and him approaching in front of you, Pharaoh's going to be thinking the Israelites have no idea what they're doing. How foolish. How foolish. Our walk with God, my faith, your faith, it's going to appear foolish to the world. The things that I do, the way that I act, the way that I react, the way that I treat people, the way that I allow other people to treat me, it's going to appear foolish to the world, and I have to be okay with that. I have to be okay with that, because we know the Lord is at work building our faith. That's what he's interested in, is building and shaping our faith. The wise man says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. That's so hard to do. Because in any given moment, when I think I'm in control of my life, I think I understand what needs to be done. And when I understand what I think I understand what needs to be done, most of the times I'm not trusting the Lord with all my heart. I may with a little bit of my heart. Because I know a little bit better what needs to be done. And not with all my heart. But he goes on, he says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. I mean, that's kind of the story of the Red Sea in a nutshell, isn't it? I think that's my life in a nutshell as well. And yours also. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. And when you do that, guess who gets the glory? God will be glorified by you in your life. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's not, life isn't about understanding exactly what's going on in the situation or maybe how God is going to work, but it's about trusting that God is going to work through you and that He gets the glory. Because He'll always make a way. Tonight, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we give you the opportunity. Maybe you're ready. Maybe you're ready to become a child of God. You're ready to put your faith in what Jesus has done for you. You're tired of messing your own life up. You're ready to give it to Jesus. Let him fix it. Because he's the only one that can. You can do that tonight by repenting of your sins and being baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of those sins. And he will clothe you with his righteousness. Not your own, but his righteousness. And you will have a Father in heaven. And you'll be filled with the Spirit who will lead you. If you're already a child of God, Maybe you've been leaning on your own understanding. Maybe you've been trusting in yourself and not in the Lord. Maybe you're ready to make that right. Whatever your need is, come forward while we stand and while we sing.